Hello guys, Colin here. Patch cables. Everyone's been asking how I make my patch cables ever since I started showing them on the channel. So I thought I'd give you a little insight in today, saying I've got to make a whole bunch of them for my brand new uh, loop switcher, which I bought from Buzz Electronics. The patch cables would be like this one that you've seen here. It's purple PVC coated wire with the right angle flat jack plugs on it. Now, for this project, they're gonna be slightly different from the two-sided flat pancake jack because the connections on the back of the Buzz Electronics loop switcher are so close together that these circular connections are just too wide to fit comfortably next to each other. They don't all quite go in properly. So I'm choosing to put those ends on these more narrow square type right angle jacks and the pancakes will still stay on the side with the pedals because that gets the pedals really close together on the pedal board. So let's go and see how it's done. So let's go through everything we need for this. Obviously, the jack plugs and the cable. This is Shark brand coaxial. Good quality, but nothing stupidly expensive. Soldering iron, trust nothing less. And our helping hands. These will hold the cables and jacks in place while we solder them. An assortment of clippers, strippers, blades and screwdrivers. And of course, the mighty heat gun so we can shrink down our heat shrink tubing. And lastly, a wee container for small parts. This particular project needs all different lengths of cable, so I'm cutting the appropriate lengths as I go. The square jack has a screw off barrel in this clear insulation section, which we can set aside for the moment. Inside we have two solder lugs. The small one connects to the tip of the jack, that's our signal, and the long one is for the sleeve, our ground. The pancake jack has a different construction. It is two halves held together by tiny screws. Inside there is an insulation disc to prevent the signal wire touching the grounded shell. We can see the small signal tip lug in the centre here. These jacks don't have a solderable ground connection. The body shell clamps directly onto the shield wiring. Measuring against the jack plug, we can decide how much insulation to remove. This soft purple PVC is easily removed by careful cuts from a sharp blade, firstly around the circumference and then along the length of the section to be removed. We can then separate out our shield or ground wiring, twisting it into a neat, tight bunch. This particular cable has a foil section of shielding as well, which can be cut away entirely. The inner core has its own tougher clear insulation, which, once measured, can be removed with cable strippers. Now that we have the signal wire exposed, we can tin it. This means coating it with solder in preparation for joining it to the connector. For the pancake jack side, we don't need to tin the ground wire. We apply solder to the lug on the pancake jack and carefully melt them into each other, giving one continuous metallic connection. I've wrapped the ground wire around the cable and now slip on some heat shrink tubing to butt up against it. This should assist in keeping everything in place and give the cable some extra girth when we clamp the jack halves together. The insulation disc goes back in its place and we can bring back the top half of the shell and screw it down. This will clamp down tight onto the ground wire, making our second connection, and the barb on the interior will punch into the insulation, holding it fast. For the other side, we need to start by making sure the barrel and the sleeve insulation are slid onto the cable before we begin soldering. There's nothing more frustrating than soldering a plug and then realising you forgot to do this and have to take it all apart again. Once again, we measure and cut the PVC, separate the ground wire and strip the interior insulation. On our square plug, we can solder onto both the signal and ground lugs as this time we'll not be relying on clamping pressure to make our connection. I've slipped over some heat shrink to insulate the signal wire once we've soldered it and I'm running the cable through the strain relief on the plug. Once again, we can solder the signal wire to the lug and shrink down the heat shrink so that nothing can short against it in the future. Then, tinning the ground wire, we can tuck it into place and solder it to the point on the ground lug that we prepared earlier. Once our electrical connections are made, we close down the strain relief claws until they grip the insulation firmly. I'm applying careful pressure with a set of pliers to do this, rotating the direction to ensure the clamp stays round. Then, we can slide up the insulation around the whole thing, bring up the barrel, screw it home, and we've got a completed patch cable. Lastly, I need to check that I've done it right and there are no shorts or bad connections. A multimeter set to continuity is ideal for this. If there's any connection from one point to another, it makes a beeping sound. If there's no connection, it stays silent. So I check tip to tip, sleeve to sleeve, and then tip to sleeve to ensure there's no shorting happening. Happy that the cable is electrically sound, we can move on and start the process over for as many patch cables as is required for the board. The first one will always take the longest as you have to work out the lengths and the processes, but after that you can churn out cables with incredible speed. 
So now that we've got all the patch cables made and wired in, I thought I'd show you how this is all set up. So I've got pedal cam down on the floor here, so to give you a bit more close-up view of what's going on in the board. Hopefully this will look okay. I've got the looper here. It's five loops, uh, so it'll take in five pedals. Of course, I've got more than five pedals on the board. There are seven pedals on the board and the Ditto X4 sitting off the board at the moment. That's just my sort of practice thing. Uh, if I was playing live, the Ditto X4 would go away. So I suppose first things first, outside of the loop we have the Polytune 2 blacklight and that's outside of the loop because when you switch on it silences everything else so it's the, still the first thing that the guitar hits is the tuner so it stays outside of the loop because I don't want it, there's no point in it taking up a, a loop in the looper. Uh, then we have the wah pedal, it's also outside the loop, mainly because I want to put wah on pretty much all the sounds that I've got programmed here. Um, so if I was to have programmed wah within the loop, then I'd need twice as many loops to get what I want. So wah stays outside the loop as well. So those two are on the outside, the other five are on the inside. With this particular loop switcher, I've got it customised so that there's two pedals uh, in the front end of the amp and three in the effects loop. So after the first two loops, it sends to the amp and then sends back, then does the next three loops and then sends back to the effects return of the amp. So what we've got is two out front, three in the loop, and that can be customised any way you want through Buzz Electronics. So as I say, this is programmable, so I've got five programs on the loop switcher. Clean, high gain, gated rhythm, solo one and solo two is what I've called them. Um, to run through them clean, uh, clean has in the loop uh, the Hoff reverb, the tape echo, Womper tape echo, and the Ibanez flanger. This is what I use for a sort of pseudo clean tone. What I'll do when I switch in that is I'll uh, change the pickup selection, rack down the volume on the guitar a little bit, and then pick lightly. That gives me this sort of a sparkly, clean, almost break up -y sound, and with the delay, reverb, and the flanger, I get a nice washy, wet, cleanish type sound. Um, it's kind of ambient, which I quite like for clean. Sounds a bit messy when you've got full in distortion, but the whole point is that I'm going to roll back on the distortion. So my clean setting doesn't actually clean up, the guitar's doing all the clean up when I'm changing the pickup and the volume knob, but that's the three that are going in there the flanger, the tape echo, and the, uh, and the reverb. For the high gain, what we have going on the high gain is pretty simple. It's just the Ibanez Tube Screamer, uh, TS9, and the Sentry Noise Gate. So that's my high gain setting. The amp is set up dirty as is, and then the Ibanez boosts it out front, and the uh, Sentry Noise Gate just clamps down on the noise. So there's nothing else going on in there. It's a very dry, very aggressive high gain sound. Gated rhythm in the middle is, as you'd expect, the noise gate out front and then the Hoff reverb in the loop. I wanted a bit of reverb on the rhythm, so it's more of a rock sound rather than a metal sound on that one. So um, it's pretty nice. I quite like that. So it's mainly just the amp and a bit of reverb, but it's got the gate on it as well just to, just to clamp down on any hiss and noise. So that makes it nice and punchy, good for live. So that would be my two rhythm sounds for live is gated rhythm and the high gain. Wow, <laughs> wow, 
Then you need two solo tones. You always need two solo tones. Can't just have one. Solo one puts in the Tube Screamer, the Hoff reverb, and the Tape Echo. So that gives me reverb, delay, and the boost. Uh, so that's your standard sort of solo sound, standard rock uh, metal solo. Solo two is the same as solo one, but with the addition of the flanger. So I'm putting in the flanger. That really good for adding a bit of movement because the flanger's set pretty low, low speed, um, and it's not really in your face. So it gives us that bit of movement um, to the sound. So if you're doing lots of tapping licks or legato licks where it's repeated notes, that movement underneath gives you, really makes this pop in the mix. And because the flanger's in the flanger is a kind of strange thing, it almost it brings it down a bit. It makes it less harsh. <laughs> And as I say, any of those sounds can have the wah pedal on them, so if I want to go into solo with the wah, uh, just engage the wah uh, as I want to. There's no noise gate on the solo sounds because I want to get the full extent of the tails um, decaying away, and when I'm playing um, a solo tone or a lead tone, there'll probably be another guitar underneath there anyway, um, so noise and hiss isn't really an issue, but when I'm playing rhythm parts, then they've both got the gate because you want to be able to stop dead on riffs and, and punchy bits. So yeah, that's why there's uh, gates on those, no gates on those, and there's no gates on the clean because I'm rolling off the volume knob of the guitar and if there was a gate on there, it would just kill everything because the volume levels drop too low uh, below the threshold of the of the noise gate. So that's, that's the basic way it's set up. So all in, it only took a couple of hours to make all these patch cables, 10 in all, for this project. And it becomes like a production line sort of thing after a while, you know, what length you need to cut things by, strip things by, you solder this, you do that. And it becomes a sort of sequential, sort of routine. As for the Buzz Electronics Loop Switcher, I would highly recommend one of these, especially if you're taking your live playing to the next level and you don't want to be stepping on four pedals at once. This makes things really convenient. The programming's nice and easy, there's a few different modes to it. They're fully customizable with the LED colors and um, how many pedals you want in the effects loop and how many you want out front, for example. So you can talk to them and get what you want. And they don't just do the five-way one like I've got here, they'll do smaller ones and bigger ones, I think up to 10-way. So you can have, if you've got a big pedal board and you want to be switching in and out 10 pedals, you can you can do that and they're remarkably cheap compared to other products that do the same thing so if you're really looking for uh, a good product and it is a good product there's no flaws to it at all it's fantastic if you're looking for one of these and you don't want to spend an absolute fortune on a switcher highly recommend checking them out link will be in the description box underneath and i'll put their web address here as well very worthwhile nice guys and um, doing great great work as ever, subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Patreon if you want to support me on there and see exclusive secret stuff. And there's other videos you've probably not seen, so go and check them out as well. Leave me a comment, all that good stuff, and keep it loud. I'll see you later.